and we are live. Isn't that exciting? I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Hello, good evening. It is 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time here in California on the edge of the Pacific, although it's actually a couple of miles from where I'm sitting right now, but pretty darn close. And uh, I am very happy to be here with you. I'm going to be reading after I waste some time, which is kind of what I do. Um, it's most of what I do, actually. <laughs> Whether it's on paper or uh, via microphone and um, webcam, that's what I do. I, I waste time, kill time, generally treat time very, very badly. As you can see, uh, Lily is here. Um, since I noticed that Jeremy said hello to Lily, um, she is not exactly the most lively cat you've ever met in your life. She's, uh, I think she's probably a senior cat now. We don't know because she was, uh, we, I, I hate saying we rescued her, but you know, I mean, whatever you want to call it, we took her in, um, without knowing how old she was or anything so but she definitely is <laughs> she does not have that kitten zippiness that you sometimes see in younger cats um she's also a little bit on the stout side and she likes to nap and eat and get petted and brushed and that's really about the extent of lily's uh engagement with real life which, you know, doesn't sound so bad to me. Um, I wouldn't get much value out of the brushing part, I guess. But other than that, you know, just getting petted, fed, and sleeping. Yeah, I could roll with that. Anyway, uh, so what was I going to say? I had a long rant last night about how fundamentally irritated I always am by action sequences. I'm thinking about this because obviously I'm finishing up Navigator's Children. And... I'm not telling the same story I told last night or, you know, not sit explaining exactly the same thing for those of you who were also listening last night. Um, but what I did say was, you know, I, I really kind of, you know, Tolkien once said that he cordially disliked allegory. Well, I cordially dislike action sequences. Uh, it doesn't mean that I won't do them and that when I do them that I don't try to do them as well as I possibly can, but they're not what interests me the most. And I decided early on that I'm much more interested in what the people are thinking and feeling while the action is happening than in the action per se. Um, but anyway, so I went on at some length about this last night um, while I was, before I started reading. And uh, then today I had a kind of a thinking day because I knew I wasn't ready to write the next bit. So I was thinking about all the different possibilities of how this particular sequence, this set of things had to happen. And what suddenly occurred to me is, oh my God, it's got to be another action sequence. That's really the only way that I can tick all the boxes that I need to tick with this. It has to be chaotic. There has to be things happening. The reader is going to have to be at least somewhat on the edge of their seat about what's going to happen next. All of these things will have to come into play. Otherwise, um, there will be no surprise in this scene. I can't explain it more than that. You'll just have to trust me. It's a, it's a pretty important thing that the readers have been waiting for for quite a while. Um, but if it doesn't have, uh, if it's not attached to a, a scene of conflict and physical confusion, um, there will be no surprise to it because it'll just happen and everybody will go, oh, that happened. Um, but I realized that that's not what I want to have in that part of the story, that if I want, I want this thing to be surprising and exciting. So therefore, <laughs> therefore, I'm going to have to write another God blessed action sequence, which, you know, I really would probably rather cut off one of my fingers. Well, no, I wouldn't rather cut off one of my fingers, but I definitely would scar myself mildly um, to avoid writing another action sequence. Not because I hate action sequences, but because it's something that, first of all, it requires a, a different kind of thought. You're not you are still thinking about character, but there's a whole raft of blocking issues, again, to use that theatrical term that, that resonates for me because of my background in theater. There's a whole lot of blocking 
And there's a lot of physical reality that has to be folded in. You know, you, you cannot simply have somebody fighting against somebody else or trying to spy on somebody or whatever without giving it the verisimilitude of trying to make certain that it actually makes sense and that everything happens the way that it would happen and that no, um, no uh, sense of what is reasonable or what makes sense is violated. Okay, and so that adds to the whole thing. And on top of it, it's also, it's, a, it's essentially, and has been since, you know, before, genre, before this particular genre was invented, um, it's also something that is frequently used in place of characterization and in place of story development and in place of good plotting, um, you know. And so you have to uh, also factor that in as well and say, okay, it cannot just be a fight. It has to be a fight where people learn things. Now, or if, even if that person is the reader, where things are learned about something, um, occasionally, occasionally you can get away with something purely for its cathartic value. But in general, um, to me, there is nothing more boring than a fight for no reason. And uh, to, to cite an, an example, um, laser fights in the Star Wars movies, okay? And now, I mean, I realize there are probably people out there who, you know, <laughs> would have me sent to Gehenna for suggesting something, but I, any sensible Star Wars fan would agree. You know, it's like there, there's never any danger to the main characters. The the stormtroopers are shot by the dozens, blown out of their shoes, left, right, and center. Um, and essentially it becomes a form of time wasting. You know, it's like in bad movies when they film every aspect of somebody driving a car which is a real common thing in bad movies. You know, you'll see the car backing out and you see people driving and, you know, oftentimes you don't even get dialogue. You just get people driving and you get a, a close-up of them driving and then you get a driver's point of view picture and then you get, you know, that kind of stuff. Similarly to how driving is used in bad movies, conflict, fighting, warfare, all of that is oftentimes used in bad genre. And... Again, Star Wars, for all its value and all the good things in Star Wars, there's a lot of really stupid laser gun fights that you, you know ahead of time that nothing's going to happen. There's nothing of significance that's going to happen. You know ahead of time that the, the, the bad guys are so unthreatening because despite their cool helmets and their shiny armor, they cannot hit anything. I mean, it's just a given. Um, and so as a result, it is essentially wasted time. And not only wasted time, but it is a kind of a violation of the, the bond with the audience. Because you can only so many times, you know, it, despite the fact that readers or viewers, whatever medium you're talking about, the readers and viewers want the protagonists or whatever passes for protagonists to succeed. And if they are invested in them as characters, they don't want them to get killed or injured or whatever in whatever violent conflict is happening. So you've already got the readers or the viewers on your side. They are already essentially rooting for the unlikely to happen, which is that there will be a violent conflict and nobody good will be injured and everybody bad will, will be hurt or killed or uh, just immobilized somehow. So that the story can then go forward and the protagonists can go forward and everybody will be happy with the results. Everybody meaning the readers or the viewers. So it's kind of a, so too many scenes of conflict is kind of a violation of the responsibility and the, the uh, agreement, essentially, the unspoken agreement between the creator and the audience that... I, if I put my characters in danger, you will feel they are legitimately in danger. If I, you know, if I don't, if I don't kill them off at a certain point, but I keep putting them in that same situation, I had better find a way to make you believe either that, that character is astoundingly lucky that they have a lot of really good friends or something like that. You know, that there has to be a reason why 
protagonists keep getting into conflicts and not getting badly hurt or killed. So back to the original thing. So what I've been messing with today, and I was, as I often do, I, I, I am um, Dr. Horizontal. So I do a lot of my thinking lying down on my back, and especially at the moment, because I've got like some kind of pinched nerve in my neck um, or something, whatever it is, it, it's been hell. But that aside, so I'm lying on my back as usual and I'm staring up at the ceiling and sometimes I've got earbuds in to shut out the distractions of the household. And I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it and I'm going, you know, th this really is only going to work if there is violence. <laughs> this is only going to work with violence. How do I make some violence happen here? So in, in essence, I am going out of my way to create a situation where violence will happen, which is another form for me, another form of, what's, what do I want to call it? It's, it's another form of cheating, you know? It's like if I, in my mind's eye, if the violence was not going to happen, um, but I've provoked it just because the plot needs it, I'd better really find a way to make it make sense. Um, so anyway, long story but that's the basic thing. So I was shocked, dismayed, <laughs> mildly depressed to realize after my long screed last night about how I didn't want to overdo scenes of conflict because at best, they're not my favorite thing to do. At worst, they outright irritate me. Um, and then, so there I am today thinking, okay, what comes next? Another ripping scene of conflict and even a bigger one than the last one that I was just complaining about. Um, I'm hoping at least barring anything I can't think of that I can't think of at the moment that it, it will be the last one. It will be the last major scene of conflict and violence. Not that I've got anything against them. They're crucial to this kind of story, but you know, I, I don't want to keep going back to that well over and over again because it tires me. It is wearying to write scenes of people fighting with other people and trying to get it all right from a uh, perspective of it both being believable and being fulfilling to the readers. Anyway, end of editorial, I guess, for lack of a better word. Everything else is going okay. We are still in the process of dealing with house stuff. We're still in the process of dealing with um, issues with my dad and what he's going to do. So I don't really have anything to, to share on those matters. Um, dogs are fine. Cat sleeping. Um, kids are fine. Heard uh, from our daughter who is up north with her partner and they sound like they're doing okay under the circumstances and uh so that's where i am and i'm finishing the navigator's children which is really the only thing that i have any control over in this strange world um so that's where i'm at and now i'm going to check in and say hello to the people who are here and claudia um you know i've always called you claudia um and i think that was because in the first place i thought you might be checking in from Germany because I have a lot of German readers. Um, and Claudia is how they say it in Germany. And maybe you say it more in the American way, Claudia. And if so, I apologize for mispronouncing. Uh, feel free to let me know. Emily. I'm assuming it's Emily. <laughs> hello, Emily. Oh, and hello, Claudia, by the way. Um, and good to, good to hear from you. Emily, hello, hello. Uh, finished writing a novel today. Okay, third draft. Excellent. So you ready for stories. Well, congratulations on finishing the book. That's wonderful. You will certainly hear from me when I've finally been able to put the Navigator's Children to bed, even just the rough draft, which is coming up in the next couple of weeks, I think. Corinne, what are we going to do today, brain? Well, we're going to do what we do every day, try and take over the world. Lori, good evening, she says. How is your dad and why was your wrist in a brace during your 1 a.m. reading? Dad's doing okay. Um, he's not quite sure what he wants to do, so we're kind of hanging fire on that, whether he wants to stay in the house that he and my mom shared for 60-something years, or whether he wants to move into some kind of assisted living thing. Um, and obviously it's his decision to make, and we don't want to push him one way or the other, because we want him to do what feels like the most useful and fun, I guess, you know, I mean, he has a right to enjoy his life. 
So we're hanging on that. I was wearing a wrist brace, which is sitting around here somewhere, um, because I'm always having joint problems. I've got all kinds of joint issues. The thing with my neck is just, you know, the latest in a long line. But I've, I've had um, inf inflammation issues since I was in my late 20s, early 30s. And uh, they're periodic and they go in cycles and something sets it off. And then every, every joint I have gets inflamed and, you know, it hurts to do things. It hurts to use my hands. It hurts to use my wrists. It hurts, you know, it's just stuff. It's boring. But anyway, so that's why I was wearing that last night. I was having a particularly tough time with my left hand. And these are, even the paperback version of this is a pretty heavy book. So I thought, eh, I'll make it easier myself and I'll try to hold it with that hand. So that's why. Melissa, good evening from the lovely Kootenays. Good to have you, and I'm pleased to hear from the lovely Kootenays. Jim, hello, good to see you. Hope the family's doing well. Yes, under the circumstances. Ooh, which reminds me, I've got to call my brother. Tomorrow is his birthday. Barb Ann, hello, hello, good to see you. Timothy, salute, and cheers from Calgary. Well, cheers back to Calgary. Penny, hello, good to see you. Jeremy, hello, and yes, I already passed your greetings along to Lily. Christy, a pleasure. Good, good to have you here. Uh, Goebbels, Michigan, Corinne says. Goebbels, Michigan. Is it Goebbels or Go Bless? Like maybe somebody mispronounced God Bless, you know? Goebbels, Michigan. Anyway, um, thank you for checking in. James, hello, James. Good to see you. Hellos, says James. Tracy, hi. Good to see you. Glad to be here. Kyra, hello, hello. Nice to see you too. Kristen, greetings. A pleasure. Lori says, Lily is cute. Yes, well, she she is. She is cute. She's not the most... I'm trying to think of a proper word here. She She's not the most riveting cat. She's not a cat who is going to demand attention most of the time. She's a cat who just... As I think I said in the past, she lived in a bathroom for years. So even though I let her go out if she wants to go out, she's really not very interested in leaving this office. This is pretty much where she lives. It's kind of like a big zoo for her. Um, but she's a, she's sweet, and and we have a, we have worked out our relationship, so we get along very well down here. And she's perfectly happy to have a place where the dogs can't come and bother her. So it's all good. Hello, Ron. Good to see you. Looking forward to seeing the, the manuscript before Christmas. Okay, well, there, now I've got a date I've got to work for. Soren, good evening from British Columbia, says Soren. Um, and Soren asks, how much of what the series has done were ideas from when you wrote ms and versus things you have devised since? And were there any notable surprises? Um, ooh, tough question to answer quickly. Um, I, I probably should do like a whole thing on that sometimes because a lot of stuff um, has been completely new to these stories, but there are other issues, um, other things, other mysteries, surprises, whatever, in these books that were actually part of my original conception way back when. Um, for one thing, and I know this uh, Ron will know because I've talked to Ron about this, the idea that most of the unusual creatures in Ostinard, um, Kilpa and giants and all these were actually um, spawned from uh, the Tanuka Daya. Um, that it was something that I had already thought back in the 1980s, the late 1980s when I was writing the books the first time. So for instance, that is now a much bigger, the Tanuka Daya are a much bigger issue in these books than they were in the first set of books, um, although they were certainly present and, and had a, uh, uh, an active role in the story of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. But the, the, the whole history of the Tanuka Daya is actually a pretty important part of what's going on in these books, very important part. So for instance, there, there, there are things like that that I had thought of originally, but there just wasn't the scope within the first trilogy to go into in great detail. There are other things, however, that were surprises. And um, rather than try to think of them now, I'll, I'll make a point of doing uh, talking about this more in some other reading. So I will let you know. Uh, Kyra checks in to say cats are the best. Well, I don't know. I'm fairly fond of nematodes. 
and planaria in general. Um, and they certainly don't eat as much as cats do, and they don't have to change their litter box anywhere near as often. Jared, hello, Jared. Good to see you. Kelly, good evening, good evening. Checking in from Alberta. Isaac, hello. For a brief time, I have to cut out to play my wife's Sunday D&D &D game. Well, that is a very good excuse, and you are um, excused whenever you have to leave to go play D&D. &D. Sarah, hello. Good to see you. Um, 4 a.m., lordy. Where are you? 4 a.m., that is really early. You must be in... Well, I'll figure it out later. Tim, greetings. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, Corinne. Yes, Corinne's checking in with Emily. Susan. Hello, hello. Good evening. Um, I'm very pleased to read, so you are welcome. Um, who else have I not said hello to yet? Becky. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, Becky says action sequences aren't her favorite part to, parts to read either. Um let me see. Willer June Araneta Manares. Hello, hello. Watching and listening from the Philippines. Oh, lovely. Thank you for checking in. A real pleasure. Pamela. Hello, Pamela. Good to see you. Pamela, also known as Aurora. Um, checking in from Tacoma. And Kyra says, British Columbia is where Kyra's checking in from. And Chris Vandal. Hello, Chris. Good to see you. Um... So Claudia says, mum pronounces my name the way the Germans do. I answer to the Americanized way. So I'll go back to Claudia. And uh, unless I, I could do like a Norman Bates and pretend to be your mother. Claudia, Claudia, come here. With my knife and my wig. Um, anyway, strange, obscure thing to say. Uh, Felina, hello. Snowing in Utah tonight and gorgeous. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. And best to you and yours, too. Um, 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 have I gotten everybody else here? Yes, I think I've said hello, everybody. All right. So Sarah is checking in from Germany. That's what I thought. I have to be at work at 6. Okay, well, I better start reading. So, I've, again, I've wasted a huge amount of time bringing everybody up to date. You will remember that Simon Binnebeck... The mysterious Malachias and the mysterious little girl Lelith have arrived at Jaloy's house on the lake. And that's where we're at. And Simon has finally fallen asleep while Jaloy was taking care of the little girl who was wounded by the hounds and uh, has been talking to Benebic. And Simon has fallen asleep. No lanterns were burning and no fire. Only the mushroom pale light of the moon filtered in through the high windows, painting the cluttered room with a kind of frost sheen. Simon stared around him at the curious, unrecognizable silhouettes that littered the tabletops and the blocky, inert shapes of books stacked in crooked piles sprouting up from the floor like grave markers in a churchyard. <coughs> His eyes were drawn to one particular book that lay spread open, gleaming white, like the flesh of a bark-stripped tree. In the middle of the open page, there was a familiar face, a man with burning eyes whose head wore the branching antlers of a stag. Simon looked up at the room, then back to the book. He was in Morganes' chambers, of course, of course. Where had he thought he was? Even as the realization came to him, as the silhouettes took on the familiar shapes of the doctor's flasks and racks and retorts, there was a cautious scraping noise at the door. He started at the unexpected sound. Diagonal stripes of moonlight made the wall seem to lean crazily. The scraping came again. Simon! The voice was very quiet, as though the speaker did not wish to be heard, but he recognized it instantly. Doctor! He leaped to his feet and crossed to the door in a few steps. Why hadn't the old man knocked? And what was he doing coming back so late? Perhaps he had been away on some mysterious journey and had foolishly locked himself out. That was it, of course. Lucky that Simon was there to let him in. He fumbled with the shadowy latch. What have you been up to, Dr. Morganis? He whispered. I I've been waiting for you for such a long time. There was no answer. Even as he worked the bolt from the slot, he was filled with a sudden sense of unease. He stopped, 
with the door half unbarred, standing on his tiptoes to peer down through a crack between the boards. Doctor? In the inner passageway, splashed in the blue light of the hall lamps, the old man's hooded, cloaked form stood before the door. His face was shadowed, but there was no mistaking his tattered old cloak, his slight build, the wisps of white hair that straggled from his hood, blue-tinted in the lamp glow. Why wouldn't he answer? Was he hurt? Are you all right? Simon asked, swinging the door inward. The small, bowed figure did not move. Where have you been? What have you found out? He thought he heard the doctor say something and bent forward. What? The doctor, the words that rose up to him were full of air, painfully harsh. False messenger was all he understood. The dry, dry voice seemed to labor at speech, and then the face tilted up and the hood fell back. The head that wore the ragged fringe of white hair was a burnt, blackened ruin, a knob with cracked, empty pits for eyes, the spindly neck on which it wobbled a charred stick. Even as Simon staggered away, an unfreeable scream lodged in his throat, a thin red line spread across the front of the black leathery ball. An instant later, the mouth yawned open, a split grin of pink meat. The false messenger, it said, each word a rustling gasp. Beware! And then Simon did scream, until the blood pounded in his ears, for the burned thing spoke, beyond a doubt, with the voice of Dr. Morganes. His speeding heart took a long time to slow. He sat, breathing raggedly, and Binibic sat beside him. There is nothing of harm here, the troll said, then pressed his palm against Simon's forehead. You are chilled. Jaloy strode back from the pallet where she had replaced Malachias's blanket, kicked free when Simon's cry had startled him awake. You had powerful dreams like this when you lived at the castle, boy? She asked, fixing him with a stern eye as if daring him to deny it. Simon shivered. Faced with that overwhelming gaze, he felt no urge to tell anything but the truth. Not until... Until the last few months before, before, before Morgenes died, said Jaloy flatly. Benebic, unless the learning I have has deserted me completely, I cannot believe this is chance for him to dream of Morgenes in my house. Not a dream like that. Benebic ran a hand through his own sleep-tousled hair. Valada, Jaloy, if you do not know... How can I? Daughter of the mountains, I feel that I am listening to noises in the dark. I cannot make out the dangers that surround us, but dangers I know they are. Simon dreams of a warning against false messengers, but that is only one of too many mysterious things. Why the Norns, the Black Rimmer's men, Filthy bookin. Jaloy turned to Simon and gently but forcefully pushed him back onto his cloak. Try and go back to sleep, she said. Nothing will enter the house of the witch woman that can harm you. She turned to Binibic. I think if the dreaming he has described is as coherent as it seems, he will be of use in our search for answers. Lying on his back, Simon saw the Velada and the troll as black shapes against the firefly gleam of the embers. The smaller shadow leaned close to him. Simon, Benebic whispered, are there any other dreamings that have been left out that you have not told? Simon slowly wagged his head from side to side. There was nothing, nothing but shadows, and he was tired of talking. He could still taste the fear from the burned thing in the doorway. He only wanted to surrender to the sucking pull of oblivion, to sleep, to sleep. But it did not come so easily. 
Although he held his eyes tightly closed, still the images of fire and catastrophe rose before him, tossing in place, unable to find a position that would encourage his tight muscles to loosen. He heard the quiet talk of the troll and the witch woman scratch away like rats in the walls. Finally, even that noise ceased, and the solemn breathing of the wind rose again in his ears. He opened his eyes. Jaloy was sitting alone before the fire, shoulders up like a bird huddling from the rain, eyes half open. He could not tell if she was sleeping or watching the fire smolder out. His last waking thought, which rose slowly up from the deep inside of him, flickering as it came like a fire beneath the sea, was of a tall hill, a hill crowned with stones. That had been a dream, hadn't it? He should have remembered, should have told Binibic. A fire sprang up in the darkness of the hilltop, and he heard the creaking of wooden wheels, the wheels of dream. When morning came, it did not bring the sun with it. From the window of the cottage, Simon could see the dark treetops at the far edge of the bowl, but the lake itself wore a thick cloak of fog, even directly below the window, the water was hard to see, slowly swirling mist making all things hazy and insubstantial. Above the top of the murky tree line, the sky was a depthless gray. Jaloy had marched the boy Malachias out with her to gather a certain healing moss, leaving Binibic behind to tend to Lelith. The troll seemed faintly encouraged about the child's condition, but when Simon looked at her pale face, and the faint movements of her small chest, he wondered what difference the little man could see that he could not. Simon rebuilt the fire from a pile of dead branches that Jaloy had stacked neatly in the corner, then went to help change the girl's dressings. As Binibic peeled the sheet back from Lella's body and lifted away the bandages, Simon winced, but would not let himself turn away. Her whole torso was blackened by bruises and ugly tooth marks, the skin had been torn from under her left arm to her hip, a ragged slash a foot long. As Binibic finished cleaning the wound and bound her up again with broad strips of linen, little roses of blood bloomed through the cloth. Does she really have a chance to live? Simon asked. Binibic shrugged, his hands engaged in the making of careful knots. Jaloy thinks she may, he said. She is a woman of a stern and direct mind who places people not above animals in her esteem, but that is still esteem most high. She would not struggle against the impossible, I am thinking. Is she really a witch woman, like she said? Benedict pulled the sheet up over the little girl, leaving only her thin face expo exposed. Her mouth was partly open. Simon could see that she had lost both her front teeth. He felt a sudden bitter ache of empathy for the child, lost with only her brother in the wild forest, captured and tormented, frightened. How could the Lord Eusiris love such a world? A witch woman? Binibic stood up. Outside, Kantaka clattered up the front door bridge. Jaloy and Malachias would be close behind. A wise woman, certainly she is, and a being of rare strength. In your tongue I understand witch to mean a bad person, one who is of your devil and does her neighbors harm. That the Valada is certainly not. Her neighbors are the birds and the forest dwellers, and she tends them like a flock. Still, she was leaving Rimmersgard many years ago, many, many years ago, to come here. Possible it is that people who once lived around her thought some nonsense as that. Perhaps that was the cause of her coming to this lake. Benedict turned to greet the impatient Kantaka, scratching through the deep fur of her back as she wriggled in pleasure, then took a pot out to the front door and lowered it down into the water. Returning, he hung it on a hook chain over the fire. 
You have known Malachias from the castle, you said. Simon was watching Kentaka. The wolf had trotted back down to the lake and was standing in the shallows, lunging at the water with her snout. Is she trying to catch fish? he asked, laughing. Binibic smiled patiently and nodded. And catch them she can do, too. Malachias? Oh, oh, yes, I knew him there, a little. I caught him once, spying on me. He denied it, though. Did he speak to you? Did he tell you what he and his sister were doing in Aldhort? How they were captured? Kentaka had indeed caught a fish, a shining silver thing that fluttered wildly but pointlessly as the wolf mounted onto the lake's edge, streaming with water. More luck I would be having trying to teach a rock to sing. Binibic found a bowl of dried leaves on one of Jaloy's shelves and crumbled a handful into the pot of boiling water. Instantly, the room was full of warm, minty smells. Five or six words I have heard from his mouth since we found them up in that tree. He remembers you, though. Several times I have seen him staring at you. I think he is not dangerous. In fact, I have a real sureness of it. But still, he is in need of watching. Before he could speak, Simon heard Kantaka give a short bark down below. He looked out the window in time to see the wolf spring up from mostly devoured catch left on the lake shore and bound away up the path. Within a moment, she had disappeared into the mist. She soon came trotting back, followed by two dim shapes that gradually became Jaloy and the odd fox-faced boy Malachias. The two of them were talking animatedly. Kinkipa! Binibic snorted as he stirred the pot of water. Now he is speaking. As she scraped her boots at the doorway, Jaloy leaned her head inside. Fog everywhere, she said. The forest is sleepy today. She entered, shaking out her cloak, followed by Malachias, who again looked wary. The color was high in his cheeks. Jaloy went promptly to her table and began sorting out the contents of a pair of sacks. Today, she was dressed like a man in thick wool breeches, a jerkin, and a pair of worn but sturdy boots. She exuded an air of calm force, like a war captain who had made all possible preparations and now waited only for the battle to commence. Is the water ready? she asked. Binibic leaned over the pot and sniffed. It is seeming to be, he said after a moment. Good. Jaloy untied a small cloth bag from her belt and removed a handful of dark green moss, still shiny with beads of water. After dumping it unceremoniously into the pot, she stirred it with a stick Binibic had given her. Malachias and I have been talking, she said, squinting down into the stream, into the steam. We have spoken of many things. She looked up, but Malachias only ducked his head, his pink cheeks even reddening a bit further, and went to sit beside Lelith on the pallet. He took the girl's hand and stroked her pale, damp forehead. Jaloy shrugged. Well, we shall speak when Malachias is ready. For now, we have tasks enough, anyway. She lifted some of the moss on the end of the stirring stick, poked it with her finger, then plucked a bowl from a small wooden table and scooped the whole sticky mess out of the pot. She carried the steaming bowl over to the mattress. While Malachias and the witch woman made poultices of the moss, Simon walked down to the lakeside. The outside of the witch woman's cottage looked quite as odd by daylight as the inside seemed by night. The thatched roof came to a point, like a strange hat, and the dark wood of the walls was covered all over in black and blue rune paintings. As he walked around the house and down to the shore, the letters disappeared and reappeared as the angle of the sun changed. Mired in the dark shadows beneath the hut, the twin stilts on which it stood also seemed covered with some kind of unusual shingles. Kantaka had returned to the carcass of her fish, delicately worrying the last bits of meat loose from the slender bones. Simon sat beside her on a rock, then moved a bit farther away in response to her warning growl. 
he threw pebbles out into the swallowing mist, listening for the splash, until Binibit came down to join him. Break your fasting? the troll asked, handing him a knob of crusty dark bread, liberally smeared with pungent cheese. Simon ate it quickly, then they sat and watched a few birds picking in the sand of the lake shore. Volada Jeloy would like you to join us, to be part of the thing we are to be doing this afternoon, Benebic said at last. What thing? Searching. Searching answers. Searching how? Are we going somewhere? Benebic looked at him seriously. In some way, yes. No, no, do not be looking so cross. I will explain. He cast a pebble. There is a thing that is done sometimes when ways of finding out things are closed. A thing that the wise can do. My master, Ukekuk, called it walking the road of dreams. But that killed him. No, that is to say... The troll's expression was worried as he searched for words. It, it is to say, yes, he died while on the road. But a, a man may die on any road. That is not meaning that anyone who walks upon it will be dying. People have been crushed by carts in your main row, but hundreds of others walk upon it every day without harm. What exactly is the road of dreams? Simon asked. I must first admit, Benebic said with a sad half-smile, that the dream road is more dangerous than main row. I, I was taught by my master that, that this road is like a mountain path higher than any others. The troll lifted his hand in the air above his own head. From this road... Although the climbing of it has great difficulty, you can see things that never otherwise would you have seen. Things that from the road of every day would be invisible. And the dream part? I was taught that by dreaming is one way to mount up to this road. One any person can do. Binibic furrowed his brow. But... When a person reaches to the road by ordinary night dreaming, he cannot then be walking along the road. He sees from one spot only and then must come back down. So, okay, Cook told to me, this one does not often know what he is looking at. Sometimes, he gestured out at the mist that clung to the trees and lake, it is only fog that he sees. The wise one, though, can be walking along the road once he has mastered the art of climbing to it. He can be walking and looking, seeing things as they are, as they change. He shrugged. Explaining is difficult. The dream road is a place to go and see things that cannot be seen clearly where we stand beneath the waking sun. Jaloy is a veteran of this journey. I have been given some experience of it myself, although I am no master. Simon sat staring quietly out across the water for a while, thinking about Binibic's words. The lake's other shore was invisible. He wondered idly how far away across the water it was. His tired memories of their arrival the day before were as hazy as the morning air. Now that I come to think of it, he realized, how far have I come? A long way, farther than I ever thought I would travel, and still have many leagues to go, I'm sure. Is it worth the risk to better our chances of reaching Naglamond alive? Why had such decisions fallen on him? It really was horribly unfair. He wondered why God had picked him out for such mistreatment, if indeed it was true, as Father Dreyason used to say, that he kept his eye on everyone. But there was more to think about than just his anger. Binibic and the others 
seemed to be counting on him, and that was something Simon was not used to. Things were expected of him now. I'll do it, he said finally. But tell me one thing. What really happened to your master? Why did he die? Binnebeck slowly nodded his head. I am told that there are two ways that things can happen on the road, things that are dangerous. The first, and it is usually happening only to the unskilled, is that if one tries to walk the road without proper wisdom, it is possible to miss the places where the dream road and the track of earthbound life go separate ways. He skewed the palms of his hands. The walker then cannot locate that way back. But Ukekuk, I am thinking, was far too wise for that. Going lost and homeless in those imagined realms touched a responsive point in Simon, and he sucked in a breath of damp air. Then what happened to Ukekuk? The other danger he was teaching me. Binnebeck said as he stood up, was that there are other things beside the wise and the good that roam upon the road of dreams, and other dreamers of a, a more dangerous sort? It is my thinking that he met one of those. Binnebeck led Simon up the little ramp into the cottage. Jaloy unstoppered a wide pot and stuck two fingers in, bringing them out covered with a dark green paste even stickier and stranger smelling than the moss poultice. Lean forward, she said, and wiped a gob of it on Simon's forehead, just above his nose, then did the same for herself and Binnebeck. What is it? Simon asked. It felt strange on his skin, both hot and cold. Jaloy settled herself before the sunken fire and gestured for the boy and troll to join her. Nightshade, mock foil, white wood bark to give it the proper consistency. She ranged the boy, the troll, and herself around the fireplace in a triangle, placing the pot on the floor by her knee. The sensation on his forehead was most curious, Simon decided, as he watched the volata throw green twigs onto the fire. White streamers of smoke went writhing upward, turning the space between them into a misty column through which her sulfurous eyes glowed, reflecting the firelight. Now, rub this on both your hands, she said, scooping out another goblet for each of them, and a dab on your lips, but not in your mouth, just a dab, there. When all was finished, she had them reach out and join hands. Malachias, who had not spoken since Simon and the troll had returned, watched from the pallet beside the sleeping child. The strange boy looked tense, but his mouth was set in a grim line as though he willed himself to keep his nervousness hidden. Simon stretched his arms out on both sides, clasping Binnebeck's small dry paw in his own left hand and Jaloy's sturdy one in his right. Hold tightly, the witch woman said. There is nothing terrible that will happen if you let go, but it will be better if you hold on. She cast her eyes down and began to speak softly, the words inaudible. Simon stared at her moving lips, at the drooping lids of her wide eyes. Again he was struck by how much she resembled a bird, a proud, steep-soaring bird at that. As he continued to gaze through the column of smoke, the tingling on his palms, forehead, and lips began to bother him. Darkness was suddenly all around, as though a dense cloud had passed before the sun. In a moment he could see nothing but the smoke and the red fire glow beneath it. All else had disappeared into the walls of blackness that loomed up on either side. His eyes were heavy, and at the same time he felt as though someone had pushed his face down in snow. He was cold, very cold. He fell backward, toppling, and the blackness was all around him. After a time, and Simon had no idea how long it might have been, only that through it all he could still faintly feel the grip 
on both his hands, a very reassuring sensation. The darkness began to glow with a directionless light, a light that gradually resolved itself into a field of white. The whiteness was uneven. Some parts of it shone like sunlight on polished steel. Other places were almost gray. A moment later, the field of white became a vast, glittering mountain of ice, a mountain so impossibly tall that its head was hidden in the swirling clouds lining the dark sky. Smoke belched, smoke belched from crevices in its glassy sides and streamed upward to join the cloud halo. And then, somehow, he was inside the great mountain, flying as rapidly as a spark through tunnels that led ever inward, dark tunnels that were nevertheless lined with mirroring ice. Uncountable thousands of shapes made their way through the mists and shadows and frost gleam, pale-faced, angular shapes who marched the corridors in moving thickets of glimmering spears or tended the strange blue and yellow fires whose smokes crowned the heights above. The spark that was Simon still felt two firm hands grasping his own, or rather felt something else that told him he was not alone, for certainly, certainly a spark could have no hands to hold. He was at last in a great chamber, a vast hollow in the mountain's center. The roof was so high above the ice-glazed tiles of the floor that snow flurried down from its upper reaches, leaping whirling clouds of snow like armies of tiny white butterflies. In the center of the immense chamber was a monstrous well whose mouth flickered with pale blue light and which seemed the source of a hideous heart-squeezing fear. Some heat must have been floating up from its unguessable depths, for the air above it was a roiling pillar of fogs, a misty column gleaming with diffuse colors, like a titan icicle catching the sun's light. Hanging somehow in the fog above the well, its shape not quite clear, or its dimensions entirely guessable, was an inexplicable something, a thing made up of many things and many shapes, all colorless as glass. It seemed, as its lineaments appeared here and there in the swirling mist pillar, a creation of angles and sweeping curves of subtle, frightening complexity. In some not quite definable way, it seemed an instrument of music. If so, it was an instrument so huge, alien, and frightening that the spark that was Simon knew he could never hear its awful music and live. Facing the well, in an angular seat of rime-crusted black rock, a figure sat. He could see it clearly, as though suddenly he hovered directly over the terrible blue-burning well. It was cloaked in a white and silver robe of fantastic intricacy. Snowy hair streamed down over its shoulders to blend almost invisibly with the immaculate white garments. The pale form lifted its head, and the face was a mass of shining light. A moment later, as it turned away again, he could see that it was only a beautiful, expressionless sculpture of a woman's face, a mask of silver. The dazzling, exotic face turned back toward him. He felt himself pushed away, brusquely disconnected from the scene, like a clinging kitten being pulled free from the hem of a dress. A vision swam up before him that was somehow a part of the wreath of fogs and the grim white figure. At first it was only another patch of alabaster whiteness. Gradually it became an angular shape crisscrossed with black. The black shapes became lines. The lines became symbols. At last an open book hung before him. On its open pages were letters Simon could not read, twisting runes that wavered and then became clear. A timeless instant passed, then the runes began to shimmer once more. They pulled apart and reformed themselves into black silhouettes, three long, slender shapes, three swords. One 
had a hilt shaped like the tree of Eusiris, another a hilt like the right angle cross beams of a roof. The third had a strange double guard, the cross pieces making with the hilt a sort of five pointed star. Somewhere, deep in Simon's self, he recognized this last sword. Somewhere, in a memory black as night, deep as a cave, he had seen such a blade. The swords began to disappear, one by one, and when they were gone, only gray and white nothingness was left. Simon felt himself falling back, away from the mountain, away from the well chamber, away from the dream itself. A part of him welcomed this falling away, horrified by the terrible forbidden places where his spirit had flown, but another part of him did not want to let go. Where were the answers? His whole life had been caught up, snagged by the passage of some damnable, remorseless, uncaring wheel, and deep in the part of himself that was most private. He was desperately angry. He was frightened, too, trapped in a nightmare that would not end, but what he felt now was anger. At that moment, it was the stronger. He resisted the pull, fighting with weapons he did not understand to retain the dream, to wring from it the knowledge he wanted. He seized the fast-diminishing whiteness and furiously tried to mold it, to make it into something that would tell him why Morgenes had died, why Dolchaius and the monks of St. Hotterans had perished, why the little girl Lelith lay close to death in a hut in the depths of the wild forest. He struggled, and he hated. If a spark could weep, he wept. Slowly, painfully, the ice mountain formed again from the blankness before him. Where was the truth? He wanted answers. As Simon's dream self struggled, the mountain grew taller, grew more slender, began sprouting branches like an icy tree as it reached into the heavens. Then the branches fell away, and it was only a smooth white tower a tower that he knew. Flames burned at its summit. A great booming sound came like the tolling of a monstrous bell. The tower wavered. The bell thundered again. This was something of dreadful importance. He knew something ghastly, something secret. He could feel an answer almost within reach. Little fly! You have come to us, have you? A horrible, searing black nothingness reached up and engulfed him, blocking out the tower and the sounding bell. He felt the breath of life burning away inside his dream self as infinite coldness closed around him. He was lost in the screamingly empty void, a tiny speck at the bottom of a sea of infinite black depths, cut free from life, breath, thought. Everything had vanished. Everything except the horrible, crushing hatred of the thing that gripped him, smothered him. And then, beyond all hope, he was free. He was soaring, dizzyingly high above the world of Ostenard, clutched in the strong talons of a large gray owl, flying like the wind's own child. The ice mountain was disappearing behind him, swallowed up in the immensity of the bone-white plain. In impossibly swift moments, the owl carried him away over lakes and ice and mountains, winging toward a dark line on the horizon. Just as it came clear to him, as the line became a forest, he felt himself beginning to slip from the owl's claws. The bird clutched him tighter and dropped earthward in a whistling dive. The ground leaped up and the owl spread wide wings. They flattened out gliding and whirled across the snow fleets. Snow they flattened out gliding and whirled across the snowfields toward the security of the forest. And then they were under the eaves and safe.
and that's where we're going to stop because that's the end of that section and there's still many pages left in the chapter so i think that's all pretty straightforward and most of you probably read that before anyway so um and that's it. It's 8 o'clock, so I'm going to wrap it up. Sorry for a slightly late start on the reading, but that's what happens when you let me talk. You should all be posting in the chat section. Tad, shut up and read. Because once you get me started, you know, I, I, I have this horrible reflex of just starting to talk, and then I keep thinking of things. And then I think of new things. And then I think of other things about the things that I thought about that I also feel the need to say. And I'm doing it again. So with that, I will say thank you for joining me. Uh, barring something unusual going on um, and uh, s s barring, you know, something happening that, uh, you know, forces me to be at my dad's house next weekend, um, I will be reading again my normal times. Uh, 1 a.m. on Sunday morning and then again 7 p.m. this particular slot on Sunday evening. Both of them California time. And yeah, so that's where we're at. So again, my pleasure to have you join me. Um, it's always good to see you and to feel your vibes. I, I feel those vibes and I love those vibes. So thank you very much for joining me. Take good care of yourselves, take good care of your friends, neighbors, and loved ones, because if you don't, who will? And I will see you next week, I assume. Um, I hope so, anyway. And I hope you will all have a good week. Until then, peace and good night. <laughs>